All right, Deborah. Thank you. What is it, Deborah? You know. Hi, Tom. Ron. Hi. Uh, yeah, you were right the first time. It's Deborah. Good. Good. So my question is about altruism and how it got so entrenched. I mean, I know that now it is. And so that makes it really hard to get people to really let go of it in favor of something that's more life affirming. But how did it get so entrenched in the first place? It seems like it people would have been really resistant to accepting a system of morality that says you can't live and be happy. And that even now, when people hear about objectivism and the objectivist ethics, they'd say, oh, there's a system of morality that says I don't have to be, feel guilty about trying to be happy and take care of myself, but I'm allowed to live and be happy and that it's actually good for me to do that. Okay, well, I'm gonna drop altruism like a bad habit and go for egoism instead. Like even now I'm baffled by the fact that it's so hard to sell that to people. But, but, but the fact that it got so entrenched in the first place, it's like, it's, it's like there were, it's as if there were a species of animal or something that, that just, they were hell bent on running off a cliff all the time. And that species would not last very long. So wh what do you think the I answer is? I think it makes more sense that it got so entrenched than that it's so difficult today, right? So I can see how it got entrenched. I just don't see why people don't give it up because it's so obviously a failure. And so, and there's an alternative now where there wasn't in the past. So think about, so I think it came out of kind of tribal society where it was presented to people as there's no real choice because we have to stick together and, and the tribe has to survive and your children depend on the tribe and you need a sacrifice for the tribe. And it's kind of a, an aspect of the tribalism collectivism in which we kind of evolved. And as part of that, because we are an animal that requires explanations, you know, why is this happening? Why is that happening? We needed witch doctors, right? Witch doctors was one of the earliest professions uh, I think human beings had because we needed explanations and they came up with these explanations and then they had a very strong incentive to also start guiding our lives and telling us, well, I know how we should live because it's hard because we're not, you know, it, I, I, I don't quite understand how human beings evolved. So human evolution is an interesting science, scientific question, because, you know, there are lots of different humanoids and, Homo sapiens is just one branch that actually landed up dominating. To what extent did the others have free will? Did they have a little bit of free will, mostly free will, none free? The whole question of when did free will come in and all of that. So imagine, you know, going from animal to human suddenly and being completely dependent on your own thinking. Now, it didn't happen to one individual, right? It happened over time. And I, well, we don't know exactly how it happened, but it happened somehow. And you're confronted with all this and you don't know. So the witch doctor then hooks up, as Ayn Rand describes it, with Attila, the, the tribal chief. And they basically rule over man. For, for And most people just go along because they can't imagine an alternative. And it doesn't, nobody really imagines an alternative. Nobody really imagines you can discover kind of truth or anything outside of the witch doctor until Greece, until uh, Greece. So then you get this Greek period where suddenly there's this awakening and individualism and, and heroism. And, and it's just stunning, right? That they achieved what they achieved when they achieved it. And in a sense, out of nowhere, um, in, in, a, in a deep sense. And then for whatever historical reason, and I don't know the history well enough, um, Aristotle, Aristotelian ethics in particular are not really picked up. Um, and so when Rome rises, there's a search for how to live and what to guide yourself, but there's no clear answers. There's, there's no principles and there's nothing really. And it's a very bifurcated society. There's, there's the aristocratic, wealthy, there's the, the poor, there's slavery, um, and there's no universal ethic. So yes, the Roman aristocrats have an ethical code that they live by that is not horrible, right, probably early on, becomes more horrible over time, but it's probably not pretty good, maybe even based on some Aristotelian principles, some idea of pride and honor and, and, and things like that. But nobody else in society can, and nobody else can afford to. And this is my point about why I understand it back then. Mm. 
what did Hobbes say about human life? Um, uh, nasty, short, brutish, short, solitary, nasty, short. something. Yeah. Nasty, brutish, and short. And Ayn Rand criticized him for saying that. And that's right. As a philosopher, that's a horrible thing to say. But that's, as a scientist looking out at human beings, that's a very accurate thing to say. When he said it in the 17th century, life was uh, nasty, brutish, and short. And certainly for poor people in the Roman Empire, laugh, life was for the most part nasty, brutish, and short. And then comes this religion. Again, we're looking for answers and we're looking for universal answers. And this, the answer that they give is, there is this God uh, and there's this, this amazing superhero who died for you so that you could be redeemed and that you could go to heaven. And you see him on a cross and he's this magnificent thing that died for you. And isn't that amazing so that you can live? And yes, this life sucks. It's nasty, brutish, and short. But there is a heaven and mm. you, know, you will get rewarded for your sacrifices and for living for this. And hey, if we poor people all stick together, maybe one day we can overthrow the Romans and maybe help all poor people. And they do, right? They, they basically, Rome becomes so decadent and so corrupt and so um, anti-intellectual, anti-intellectual, that ultimately, you know, Constantine um, converts to Christianity. It's the dominant philosophy of the time, I guess. And he doesn't, you know, he doesn't believe it. He's not going to sacrifice, but he wants to hedge it bets just in case there's an afterlife. And he's picks up the sword and he slaughters people. So that, that doesn't stop him. But for poor people, this is the way to salvation. And then you have a thousand years of, well, more than a thousand years, you know, maybe 1200 years of nasty, brutish, and short. What else do they have to live for? They have to live for death. Really, Christianity has taught them that the purpose of life is to die. And when you die, you get rewarded if you live according to these principles. Uh, and those principles are guided by. And then the Enlightenment tries to challenge that, beginnings, begins to challenge that, right? There's the pursuit of happiness. There's, there's this idea of individualism. There's the idea of happiness. There's the idea of success. There's the idea of universality, the universality of reason, the universality of a... Maybe there's a moral code that's better, but they can't quite give up on God yet. And they can't give up on Christianity yet. It's still got a grip on them. So they're, they're struggling. They're struggling, but they come close. God, they come close, right? Well, damn, they come close. And then, you know, I'm not a philosopher, but based on my understanding, then comes Immanuel Kant and he basically takes altruism and secularizes it and embeddies it in the culture, in the, in the philosophical culture, rips apart all the Enlightenment's achievements philosophically, says all of this is wrong. Look at all the mistakes you've made. Look, none of this makes any sense. Reasserts this uh, altruism as the only moral possibility there is. And until Ayn Rand people now don't have any way to go. They, 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 they're confronted with religion, has some morality, has some guidance, secularism, there's nothing. You know, the Hegelian, whatever, Marx, nothing. Um, and, and, um, and certainly no alternative morality to Christianity. They all have the same Christian morality, there's nothing. So it's only Ayn Rand, and, and there's no real, the Enlightenment is dead as, a, as an ideology being taught, from a moral perspective. So people have absorbed the egoism into their lives. So they live somewhat self-interested lives, but they're raked with guilt because of the altruism. And to this day, that's where we are. And it's only Ayn Rand who suddenly comes around and, and says, yes, let's complete the Enlightenment project. I mean, that was not her goal, but that's what she literally does. She completes the Enlightenment project and she establishes egoism on proper foundations and explains it and articulates it and it, it and you could make the argument maybe it's too late because the enlightenment mm. spirit has been already sucked out you could make the argument that no it's still so entrenched and we haven't made the argument well enough and you can make i, I don't know what the answer is about why we can't get through today but i understand it two thousand years ago much more than i understand it now hmm well, I was thinking that the reasons for today, it, it makes more sense to me now 
uh, given that it's already entrenched, there's all kinds yeah. of social pressure and there's the fear of, of uh, going against the grain and, and the insecurity that's entrenched in people's minds because they were, grow they were raised with altruism, which says you're no good and other people are what really matter. You know, so like to me, actually, it makes more sense now than it does then, yeah, and, unfortunately. And, I still and, don't get it. It seems like people... That. Yeah. And beyond that, think of the art, right? So all the superheroes are there to sacrifice their own happiness for the sake of mankind, right? For the sake of others. I mean, they're no egoistic superheroes mm -hmm. and they're never presented as egoistic. They're all playing by some kind of altruistic rules. Um, our literature is filled with altruistic. So all the models, all the models of behavior, um, altruistic models of behavior. And it, the, the only people who model egoism in life are businessmen. And, and that's rejected, right? It, that, that's, 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 uh, that's part of the why they hate it. Um, what is that animal behind you? It's a turtle, oh. <laughs> a painted turtle. Yeah. Is that a rat? <laughs> what, what exactly is going on? Because it's moving. Yeah, it's, it's a alive. Painted. <laughs> it's a painted turtle. That's a species. Yeah, yeah. Oh, a painted turtle is a species. Okay. It's not a painting of a turtle. It's a painted turtle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting worried. Okay, so now I know it's a turtle. <laughs> no. I don't like I don't like rats. So it's uh, no, it's um, not a rat. <laughs> good. <laughs> um, so yes, I think I think it's it's drilled into their subconscious. I mean, I know from my upbringing, right? When I was a kid. All the stories, all the songs, all the mythology was around sacrifice, was around sacrificing for the state or sacrificing for the Jewish people or sacrificing for fill in the blank. But it was all sacrifice. And to break away from that is very, very, very difficult. And, and uh, some of us can do it. And most of us, it looks like, can't. And it's going to take a while. And part of why I always emphasize art is we have to start changing the stories we have to start telling different stories and we have to start pointing out the difference in the stories and what makes the stories different. We have to create new heroes. Um, and, and for that, we need, we need great artists who can do that, which is not easy. Because right? you can even interpret David, right? That's David uh, with, a leg, with a leg on, on Goliath's head. And there's a certain sense in which that's pretty arrogant and self-confident and, you know, Wow, I mean, that's a young kid and he's just destroyed a giant. That's self-esteem. That's everything we hold. And, and uh, But the way most people see it, first of all, they don't like it, partially because of that, right? This is mm. not art today that is shown young people, that is explained to young people, that is discussed with young people. This is of an era. This was done in the 19th century. This is of an era that it was still more enlightenment, where the, the heroes were, were important. But also, when you talk about David... David, you know, was willing to sacrifice his life for the sake of the cause. You know, that's that's the story rather than the story of heroism and pursuit of values. And it's easy to spin it that way. So hey, you're, you're on is is another way to come at Deborah's question to say, hey, life is life is not easy. It takes it takes a lot of mental effort to thrive as a human, both materially and spiritually. And, you know, collectivism is, it's an easier path. Yep. It doesn't require as much uh, mental effort. And the fact that it's already entrenched. Well, that's uh, why it doesn't require the, so much mental effort. Yeah. It's already entrenched. You just follow everybody else. You do like everybody else. You, you, you're not standing up. It's hard enough. You're right, Darius. It's hard enough just to get your work done and do a good job and earn a living and, 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 have a family and have kids and do all the things you need to do in order to thrive. And then you want me to stand up to the culture. <laughs> you want me to take a completely different course. Yeah, that's, that's rough. That, that is difficult for them. You're right. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual would be any man or woman who is willing to think, meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life 
and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the role of the collectivist brute. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.